Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection Pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. All right. So another incredible individual that Steve and I were able to meet at the Yellowstone Wolf Summit that was put on by Wolves of the Rockies back in June. He is a wilderness and wildlife advocate among many things. Uh, he first, first and foremost, former Marine, Marine Corps. So we always thank him for his service and everything that he did for our country. Uh, he's the former president of the Montana Wildlife Federation, a former member of the National Wildlife Federation, and a former member of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. He is Mr. Dave Stalling. Dave, great to see you. Uh, greetings from California to Missoula, Montana. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you. You know, I'm kind of a wise guy, but uh, sometimes when people thank me for my service, I ask if they work for Halliburton. <laughs> That's a good one. But I, I do that. appreciate the sentiment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, well, we've had a couple, because um, Mark, I know, was a former, um, he was formerly in the military too. And uh, But just because my my father's still in uh, doing some work and my brother is at the tail end of his service with the, arm, with the Army. So oh, cool. I just know what that means. Yeah. So I just, it's it's always something that I like to, to pass on and let everybody know that, you know, these, these freedoms that we have were were given to us by you all and not necessarily the individuals at the top. Well, so, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, just because you, you're, you're, you're a former member of all these wonderful, uh, or wonderful, all these different organizations throughout the course of your career, just give everybody a background uh, of yourself. Where, where did you grow up? Are you a native Montanan? You're, you're, you're a passionate, uh, but conservation, you know, conservationist in terms of hunting. Just give everybody the the background of Dave Stalling and how this all came to be. Okay. Um, I was actually born and raised on the coast of Connecticut. Ah, nice. Sound. Yeah. And uh, my dad had been a World War II era Marine and an avid and passionate fisherman. We did a lot of fishing off the coast of Connecticut for striped bass and bluefish. But my father, uh, he always took time to teach me about a lot more than the fish we were pursuing. He taught me all about the the importance of estuaries and marshes and, uh, you know, healthy waters and, and the crabs and the cormorants and, and everything, you know, I just learned so much from my dad. He was kind of a self-taught naturalist and, uh, really into the wilds and protecting the wild. So that's kind of what I grew up with. And then, uh, I went to a small forestry school in Northern New York, um, where I got in lots and lots of trouble and got put on double secret probation, you know, from the animal house days. So, uh, yep. And everybody was, was, was like, what are we going to do with this kid? And then the Marine Corps recruiter came along and he liked me. So, you know, <laughs> he said, we could use a guy like you. So I ended up in the Marine Corps and I served in a special ops unit called force recon. Hmm. And uh, when I got out of that unit, I was, you know, when I was done, I was a little bit, messed up in the head, I guess. So I ended up in Montana. I moved to Montana in 1985. Uh, spent a lot of time roaming the wilds and uh, went back to school and got a degree in journalism and wildlife and uh, worked for the Forest Service. And uh, I worked for some newspapers writing. And then uh, eventually I got into the nonprofit realm. I spent most of my career in the nonprofit wildlife conservation realm mostly with hunting and angling groups i worked for the montana wildlife federation national wildlife federation the rocky mountain elk foundation um served as president of the montana wildlife federation which is uh, montana's oldest and largest hunting and angling conservation group and i worked for many years for trout unlimited uh, in fact i worked in california for a few years for trout unlimited i worked out of berkeley and i um I was working on the recovery of native steelhead and salmon, particularly protecting their habitat and keeping waters in the river for the fish. So that, that's kind of my background. And then I ended up having a big falling out with that world, uh, at least the hunting world, um, which I was once a leader in. And I think it's because uh, they started changing and I started changing. And I, my views on things like particularly wolves and grizzlies, um, I wouldn't, I don't know if changing is the right word, but. I became more concerned about those things. And um, 
so eventually that led to me getting fired from the Montana Wildlife Federation. And I went back to school and got my MFA in creative writing. And so now I'm just, uh, when you're a writer, you have to have a real job to make money. So now I, uh, I write and I participate in nonprofit groups and I do what I can and I roam the wilds when I can. And then in the evenings, I drive a city bus for Missoula to uh, help pay the bills. So kind of in transition, I guess. There, there's the long of it. The long story. Yeah, I, I love what I love about you and, and when you gave your presentation too, is you really dove into the the personal story, not only for yourself, but just the dynamics and how things have started to shift that, like you said, when you were in all these organizations and then you, you got pushed out, what, just describe for, for those out there, your take on, because you are a hunter and an angler. So what is your take about what, what, what do you look for or what, do, how do you approach? That's the word I'm looking for. When you go out to hunt and, and fish the, the way that you respect wildlife differently than say your colleagues started to, and we'll get more into that um, in just a minute. You know, when I moved to Montana, I became kind of obsessed with elk. Um, they just lived out in the wilds in this beautiful wild country. And I read everything I could about them, um, learned all I could about them and spent all the time I could year round out in the, you know, out in the wilds. And I just found that to me, you know, Ed, Edward Abbey, the writer and philosopher, once wrote that hunting was a difficult thing to think about, never mind talk about, such a storm of conflicting emotions. And, you know, he's absolutely right. It's, it's a tough thing to talk about. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of deeply personal, and I can understand why some people don't like the idea. I mean, you're going out there and killing a beautiful animal. But for me, it became a way of really deeply connecting to the land. You know, so many of us connect through the land, through the windshields of our cars, driving around or hiking on a, a, a designated trail with signs and, and bridges. And, you know, here you're out in the wilds participating in the bedrock workings of nature, you know, to, uh, for me to, to pursue an animal like an elk throughout the wilds for days at a time and then take its life and then carry that meat out of the mountains and live off that meat. I have sort of joked with friends and I'm kind of a, 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 a vegetarian of sorts, but the non-native grasses and forbs in the wilds near where I live aren't palatable to humans. So I let the elk convert it to protein for me. And I'm only like half joking on that. There's some truth to that. You know, it's a, it can be a sustainable way to live if you're close to home, uh, and you're helping protect these wild places that sustain these animals. And then you kill them and consume them. Uh, and you're participating in the neighborhood. And uh, and that goes many ways to me. Um, another thing I only half joke about is, uh, you know, if I were to be consumed, killed and consumed by a grizzly bear, um, became grizzly poop and fertilized the grasses and the forbs that the elk eat, it would only be fair. I mean, it's a cyclic thing. So that sort of jokingly sums up my philosophy. And uh, <laughs> I don't even know if it's a joke anymore. It, I've been saying that for so many years that it's kind of a joke among me and my family and my friends. But uh, yeah. but there's also some truth to it. It kind of sums up, you know, that, that life cycle and being part of the land. I guess that's it. I, I like to see myself as kind of... Uh, fundamentally a part of the land not just a visitor and yeah uh, and it yeah no, you, you my, totally my hunting philosophy <laughs> the grizzly bro. yeah you told my hunting philosophy can be gris summed up as grizzly shit is it, is it okay to grizzly shit <laughs> yeah absolutely 100 okay. percent. yeah yeah i mean you what what because you did say that at the summit and, but it it really makes sense and, and there are we've spoken with a few hunters who I think relatively feel in are in the same vein. They feel the same way in that we are, you all are figure yourselves as part of the land, part of the ecosystem and that you take what you need for sustenance, take what you need to survive. And what what's interesting is that the more we speak to individuals such as yourself, there, there seems that there are pockets and a lot, and a lot of those pockets do have a deep respect for, the predators on the landscape, the bears, the lions, the wolves, the coyotes, and understanding how vital they are to 
the entire ecosystem and in, in, in the balance of everything that happens around them. Was that something that you always felt when you, like when you first moved out to Montana? Were, did you always have this deep respect for grizzlies and then for wolves and lions and things like that? Or did it grow over time? You know, boy, both. <laughs> How's that for an answer? Both. <laughs> That's great. You know, yeah. I mean, I always was found things like grizzlies and wolves and, and wild, truly wild remote landscapes appealing but you know as in with any relationship you don't um you know until you spend a ton of time really immersed in it you don't really get to know each other so um i i think the deep respect i have now for say particularly grizzlies i i really have a passion for wild grizzlies because i've had so many remarkable encounters with them and um for me, that came over time with really getting to know them and their country and their behavior and, and breaking through the myths and misconceptions and seeing what remarkable, amazing, intelligent, powerful animals they are who not only deserve respect, but almost demand our respect, you know. Um, and it's not just respect. It goes even deeper. There's a writer based out of Missoula, uh, but he's since passed on, the late William Kittredge once wrote we need grizzlies around if for nothing else they teach us a little humility um and i think i think the day i really gained a tremendous respect for grizzlies was uh when i was about 26 27 and i got bluff charged because uh i had a close encounter with a grizzly bear and um in hindsight did almost everything wrong I mean, I was so scared and my fear showed and I yelled at the grizzly and uh, I made, I'm assuming, I think it was a he, a young male, and he uh, he seemed frightened and confused and um, and he, he charged. <laughs> and um, that's sort of the final warning. In those days, I didn't know how to read all the warnings they give you. You know, they get nervous. They might chop their teeth and lick their lips and they might pace back and forth and they just think they're like us they get nervous and they're getting scared and then uh and then he uh, got his hair up and then he charged but that was the final warning it's what they call a bluff charge you know they'll they'll come at you and let you know <laughs> i'm pretty upset here this is your last chance <laughs> and uh and then he turned and fled and i remember um that's when i decided i wanted to learn everything i could about these animals they're remarkable and uh since then I have, and uh, I know much more about how to behave in their their country now, you know, and show them the respect they demand and deserve. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you're, what's another, and you, and you led right into it, which was perfect. That my, my question was going to be, what's, give me, give us a, a one of those encounters. What, what was another one that you had that maybe something after this, this one, it seemed, was there another one that, that sort of stuck out in your mind that is, that's taught you something or has. I've had lots, but I think the one that stands up most in my mind is when my son, Corey was maybe, uh, maybe two years old and I was carrying him on my back in a pack and we were bushwhacking through the wilds and all of a sudden a, a grizzly bear stood up maybe, uh, you know, 40 yards or so from us in the brush, which, is nothing for a grizzly. They can cover that in seconds. So, um, and I looked away and held my hands out and I tried to act as calm as I can and talk. But then my son yells, daddy, look a bear, <laughs> which, which made the bear nervous, you know, yelling like that loud and pointing. And, uh, I said, Corey, just, just be quiet. I see the bear. We're going to be quiet. We're going to walk away. And, um, and right then a cub stands up and another cub, and I'm thinking, oh boy, right? This is a not a good situation. And he yells really loud, "Look, another bear!" <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm uh, I'm trying to convey. To me, the most important thing is to convey to these animals that you are not a threat. You mean no harm. And this isn't to say that you know who knows what goes on in the mind of a grizzly. I sure don't. Um, you know, this isn't to say under other circumstances we wouldn't have been charged, but. As I kept talking calmly and apologizing to the bear and walking away, she seemed to be going through the same sort of thing. She looked at me and she dropped all fours and gathered her cubs and walked away. Looked back at us a few times and left. And, uh, you know, part of me 
likes to think, you know, here was a mother with her her kids. I'm a dad with my kid. And we're both right. like, uh, hey, you know, we love our kids. We're going to protect our kids. And uh, there was like mutual respect. So I think to me, I learned a lot from that. And from reading the works of other people like Doug Peacock. Are you familiar with Doug? I'm not familiar with Doug Peacock. What was Peacock. Is he mostly a bear individual or? If you're familiar with the works of Edward Abbey and you ever heard of uh, um, the Monkey Wrench Gang? I haven't, no. Anyway, yeah. the character Hey Duke was based on Doug. Doug uh, lives here in Montana, not far from Gardner. And um, I believe he's in his 80s now, but he's a remarkable man. He was a special forces medic in Vietnam, was pretty messed up from the war, fled to the wilds of Montana, and developed a very close connection with uh, Grizzlies. And he wrote a book about it called Grizzly Years. Um, I reread that book like every few years. And I remember uh, when it came out, I read it. And it just resonated so incredible with me that I got hold of Doug and we since became uh, somewhat friends. But he has spent his entire life uh, defending the wilds and particularly grizzly bears. And he has spent more time, I think, than anybody alive or maybe previous to that, except for maybe Charles Russell up in Canada. Uh, spent more time than anybody around grizzly bears and really got to know them. And his philosophy, in part, is, you know, these are wild animals really in tune to their environment, and they understand our intentions. They understand what we're out there to do. Um, he tells of a story of his one of his first encounters with a grizzly where he was carrying a firearm and he he pulled the firearm out and I guess aimed it at the bear and um, as the bear came towards him and things from Vietnam got into his head and he just felt he couldn't do violence anymore and he dropped the weapon, thought the grizzly might kill him and, and it's almost like something passed between him and the bear. Like, you know, um, and with all this, that's not to say you might not be bumbling through the woods and surprise a sow who has cubs and she'll attack. Um, right. You know, I'm not trying to get all mystical about it, but I also think they really sense our emotions and feelings and intentions, and they know if we mean them harm. Mm. That's why I think it's total BS when a lot of people say if, if we hunt grizzlies, they won't be as fearful as humans. Well, I think it'll make them more fearful of us because if they, they know we really might mean intent in killing them, uh, they're more likely to attack because grizzlies attack out of uh, either fear or protection for their cubs or in some rare cases, uh, protection of their food. And that's just right. how they evolve. That's their nature. You know? <laughs> so yeah. anyways, I'm kind of rambling, getting off into a different point. But um, in a nutshell, yeah, I developed this... Um, connection to and respect for grizzlies um, over many, many, many years. And another story I'll tell you is one, uh, years ago, I was struggling with a lot of stuff, not that long ago, maybe around uh, 2002 or 2003. And I, um, I packed up a backpack and just started walking north from Missoula. Um, it wasn't intended to be a fun trip. I mean, a few nights before I had considered killing myself, I drove through a trailhead with a shotgun and was going to, uh, I, I had planned to kill myself. So then I thought of my maps and I thought how for years I had looked at these maps. You could go from Missoula, Montana to Waterston, Alberta, and only cross three roads. It's the most remote wild country left in the lower 48 of the United States. Um, and I took off on that journey and I went all the way to Canada and it took me uh, three months. It was over a thousand miles, mostly off trail, just wandering, you know, only crossed three roads. Um, and it really changed my life. And one of the things that happened to me was uh, I ended up downwind of a grizzly sow with her cubs. And I was maybe a hundred yards away, like a football field length. And, um, um, you know, I felt like I was in a safe position and I watched these bears and I watched the cubs wrestling and playing and I watched them run over and try to suckle their mom. And they were a little bit old for that. You know, they might've been, uh, you know, almost two years old and getting ready to leave their mom. And she swatted one of them and he went rolling 
the strength in her paw was amazing. Swatted her and went rolling. And then to me, this might be a bit anthropomorphic, but it seemed like she felt kind of bad. So then she walked over to him and licked, licked her cub. Like, you know, I'm sorry. But, and uh, I just watched and watched. And I just started thinking about how um, grizzlies are so misunderstood. You know, people either think they're deadly beasts that are out to kill us or they're uh, these mythical gods. You know, they're neither. They're just bears out there living their lives. You know, that's what they do. And uh, um, and I started thinking how I had spent my entire life uh, defending grizzlies. Or, or I shouldn't say entire life, but a lot of my life defending grizzlies and the habitat that sustains them and accepting them and explaining to people you know, what they were really like. And yet I had denied so much in myself. And that day I came to terms with being gay. Um, and, and it was a, a huge thing for me. In fact, I, I wrote an essay with a humorous title, but a serious subject that was published widely called uh, How Grizzlies Made Me Gay, <laughs> which is kind of corny title, but, um, you know, editors, but, uh, in essence, it made me accept myself because I came to terms with how grizzlies were misunderstood and that out there in the wilds, there is no societal created myth, uh, myths and expectations. Everything is what it is. You know, a grizzly might possibly judge me as a possible threat, maybe a possible feast. Uh, but nothing else. There's no judgment, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so that also ties into my kind of deep, almost spiritual connection with the the wilds, and particularly grizzly bears. I think I've I've just learned so much from them. You know, they're they're remarkable. <laughs> That's such a powerful story. I, I know it's. I know you lay lay in humor in there, but I, I can, I can feel how that must have been to take that trek to ponder, I guess, everything that was going on in your life at that time. And it's, it's always interesting to me to talk with individuals that have had these experiences that changed their life by simply, and not simply, but just going out and being in the wild or in nature. I mean, we've, Brad Orsted just recently published his, his book, through the wilderness uh when he lost his daughter i saw that and i've been meaning to get a copy of that yeah i he is a unique a unique yeah guy. unique i mean you know you just shared this beautiful story um of coming to terms with things in your life and, and others have had these same experiences with you know whales or wolves or whatever it may be it just really seems that in your in your opinion i guess or in your personal take i mean do you think this is something that us as humans have lost is this deep connection to something that we were running around 10,000 years ago. And we were obviously, I would imagine more connected to everything around us as opposed to being set back and in our homes and, and doing the daily tasks that we do to survive for ourselves and that we don't have these interactions. We don't have these come to whatever moments to really find, I guess, what's really deep inside of ourselves. Did you ever, do you ever think that's something that? Oh, I think about has, that all the lost? time because for me, um, yeah. yeah, and I, I don't know, it's a tough thing to talk about because I think it's just deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained and you don't have to go far back that far. I mean, the, uh, right. the natives uh, who we displaced from this land here, um, you know, lived pretty close and had a deep connection for the wilds because they were part of it. And so I think when, when we do that, it's not so much, uh, the wilds are healing us. It's like a return home. It's like a return to this right. ancient connection and ancient past that at least for me makes me feel um, really comfortable. Um, come on. Yeah. That's my dog. I'm talking to anyway. Oh, it's all good. Chocolate lab. <laughs> yeah. She, I'm trying to get her back in anyways. Uh, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. No problem. So, and I don't know. And I think it's, it's odd because yeah, I do think that we're, our modern society is very disconnected to nature, but I go even further. I think even a lot of efforts out there to connect people to nature further disconnect people from nature because it's all become so artificial. I mean, you look at, a, a, you know, people go hiking. They want to 
read the trail guides and know every inch of the trail and make sure there's signs and 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 bridges and controls you know human control over it all and uh um you know every little rock on the trail is described you know be careful you don't want to trip over the third rock down and the elevation (laughs) gain and drop and it's just all and all the technology um you know it's like the element of surprise is is gone in other words it's just the the adventure is gone yeah it's still a sense of human dominance and control over everything um I, I always, I always give people the opposite advice. I say, get, get out, get off trail, just start wandering the wilds, get lost if you can, and um, don't bring anything, don't carry anything, don't tell anybody where you're going or where you'll be back. And uh, for a little while, you might feel free and connected. And if, if, if you don't make it home, congratulations, you're part of the wilds. <laughs> That's my hiking advice. Is that good hiking advice? <laughs> I don't know. I think I think some of the folks out there would be like, "Wait a minute, no." Um, well, then you'll definitely. Why I don't work for the Park Service. <laughs> I, this is why he's former member of certain things, folks. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm a former everything. Because <laughs> that advice. I mean, yeah. Well, it's I'm kind of being funny, but oh my god, there's like some truth to it. It's like. Uh, if you want to connect to nature, connect to nature. We're all part of right, it. And, right. uh, I mean, I, I want to get into that too, Dave, because it's what really uh, part of your presentation, part of what you were talking about, obviously, is that you, you were the, a former member and uh, of, of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. I think you were the president of that at one point. Oh, no, no. I am um, not the Foundation, but I did oh, work, work for it. Okay. Actually. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but I was a member and I was the... Uh, I was the conservation editor of a magazine they produced called Bugle Magazine. Got it. Okay. Right. I remember. Yeah. And I apologize for, for mixing that up. Oh, no worries. It's all <laughs> um, good. So when you were there, and I, and I wonder about this, was the, was the mission or the feeling more about what we just spoke about initially and then it started to shift? Or was there always this, or was it always sort of human dominance, human wanting to control or react to everything what what was it initially and then how did that shift over time where you where you exited from rocky mountain elk foundation oh uh, um the mission hasn't really changed i mean it was always to protect uh you know critical wintering range and and migratory corridors and calving habitat for elk uh the elk foundation came about because people started seeing you know, with all the subdivision and development going on in Montana and people developing homes and and other human structures on critical elk wintering range that it wasn't going to go well for the elk. And so, you know, people, hunters came together to start protecting elk habitat. And um, it's not so much the mission changed. There's always been this weird split in the hunting community that's hard to explain um but i'll try um there's sort of on one end is this sort of nra safari club mentality and on the other end is more what i call like the aldo leopold end of things aldo leopold was a great uh wildlife biologist and naturalist who um in the 1930s and 40s and into the 50s, wrote extensively about uh, wildlife. He was also an avid hunter. And uh, his most famous book is called The San County Almanac. And and he is considered the founder of like modern wildlife management. He became a professor and taught wildlife management. And he changed his mind throughout his life. And he had a very sort of naturalistic kind of approach that I think comes close to what I've been trying to express. But then on the other hand, you have this uh, NRFA safari club types that, uh, you know, kill the biggest animals you can, spend the most money you can to travel over to Africa and pay guides to tell you when to pull the trigger so you could make it into some Grand Slam record book. And, you know, and uh, and it's, it's odd. And so there was always that sort of split. And so in my days at the Elk Foundation, um, oh, and I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah. I had a good friend named Jim Posowitz who died a few years ago. 
Um, Jim wrote uh, Beyond Fair Chase, The Ethics and Traditions of Hunting, and a few other books on hunting. And he was uh, also a very remarkable man. And I remember when I was about 26 or 27 years old, um, and this was just soon after I got out of the Marine Corps and moved here, I was having lunch with him in Helena, Montana. And I told him I felt awkward. I felt like, uh, you know, even though I was a hunter, I didn't really feel like I felt in fit in so great with a lot of the hunting world. And this is before my Elk Foundation days. And then I mentioned that, you know, I'm also passionate about protecting wilderness. And when I hung out with a lot of my environmental friends who were anti-hunters, I didn't quite fit in with them either, you know. And he leaned towards me and he had this big grin on his face and he talked real quietly, partly as, as humor. And he said, you know why, Dave? Because you and I, we're Leopoldians. And there aren't many of us around. <laughs> and I just thought that was great. And so ever since then, I've used that term, Leopoldian. And there aren't a lot of Leopoldian hunters. I've seen surveys that have been done of, you know, the motivations of why people hunt. And generally, it's about 5 to 10% of hunters would fit into this naturalistic sort of mode where healthy functioning ecosystems are far more important than my opportunity to find and kill an elk, you right. know? I ever see wolves and grizzlies on the landscape and have a wild, healthy functioning system. And if for some weird reason that meant I could never hunt again, then fine. You know? yeah. I like wildness. But um so the Elk Foundation was having that struggle while I was there. Okay. For example, uh, I was the conservation editor of the magazine. And I remember putting together a series of articles that looked at the uh how wolves and elk interacted because at that time they were just talking about reintroducing wolves to the to the west and people are starting to get upset that it would eliminate all the elk herds and we for example looked at studies being done in canada um that concluded in general that the the predation on elk with wolves was uh not additive a compensatory in other words um if there weren't wolves in the herd, then maybe just as many elk would die eventually from winter kill or, you know, whatever it was, you know, and, uh, and then of course, everything I love about elk, their wildness, their wariness, their speed, you know, came from co-evolving with wolves. So there's that part of it too. But then there was an element really angry that we were publishing such stories, you know, and it was a lot like McCarthyism. They had come out and say, Oh, these people are anti hunters. You got to understand in the hunting community, there's a lot of paranoia driven of course by the nra just just like hey everybody's gonna they're gonna take your rifles there's also this uh they're gonna end all hunting these are you know anti-hunters you know dressed like hunters and i can't tell you how many times i was called an anti-hunter even though i killed elk every year with my bow for you know 30 years it didn't matter i was an anti-hunter because if you question things that's what happened so it became real tense in the elk foundation there were, for example, powers that be that wanted to start running ATV ads in our magazine because the ATV companies, Yamaha and others, would give a lot of money to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you know? And they wanted their products promoted in our magazine so hunters would buy their products. We didn't want to run ATV ads because I had also done a series of stories about the huge negative impacts off-road vehicles were having on elk habitat and elk hunting. And so... There was constant tension like that, if that makes yeah. sense. And more, you know, I could go on and on and on. And um, to sum it up, the uh, safari club types, the NRA types, they won. <laughs> they had more money and power. And we all came into work one day and a whole bunch of the really good conservationists, some who had actually started the Elk Foundation, uh, were fired. They were given the boot and others were put in their place. And then they brought in this guy uh, who came from NASCAR, of all places, to take over the Elk Foundation. And one of the first things he said to appeal, you know, and this is, I mean, if this is sounding familiar, think of today's changes in the Republican Party and Donald Trump. I mean, you know, on a smaller scale, this is what was happening because they would tell people what they wanted to hear. Truth, facts, logic didn't matter. If hunters wanted to think wolves were evil, we were going to tell them wolves were evil. So they started uh, 
for example, uh, and I think I use these quotes in my presentation, um, this new director that came from NASCAR called wolves the, the worst ecological disaster since the decimation of bison. We need to get rid of the wolves, and then we got to go after the grizzlies. And just promoting this perception that wolves were going to eat all our elk and there'd be nothing left to hunt. And it really rallied the hunters. I mean, when, when these folks took over the elk foundation, uh, while I was there, I had created an award, an annual award called the Olas J. Murray Award. Olas Murray was a famed wildlife biologist in the early days, about the same time Aldo Leopold was around, who did some of the first extensive research on, uh, on elk, mostly in the Jackson Hole area of Wyoming. And um, so the Olas J. Murray Award became an annual award we would give to some top uh, wildlife biologist working in the elk realm, you know, who was working to protect and restore elk habitat. And um, when the Elk Foundation went through these changes, the Murray family, uh, Marty Murray uh, was still alive, Olas Murray's widow, and um, they became so upset that they wanted the name, the Olas J. Murray Award, uh, withdrawn. And, wow. um, and a lot of people quit. But the sad part is then their membership just boomed like crazy because they were telling hunters what they wanted to hear. And a lot of hunters joined on. And now, you know, they, they became big and they, they still would do things like protect critical habitat, but everything became geared towards producing things to shoot for the hunters. They even changed their logo to hunting is conservation, which is just absolutely ridiculous. And they um, they still help Idaho pay a bounty on wolves to get rid of wolves, like it was the 1800s. And uh, so it's a horrible group now. <laughs> but it also shows it's an illustration of what can happen in the hunting world. So, um, so yeah, um, when all those good people were fired, I wasn't one of the people fired. Um, but I knew it meant we wouldn't be able to publish the stuff I wanted to publish in the magazine, you know, like things that are true. <laughs> so, you know, I quit. Yeah. I I left and that was my falling out with the Elk Foundation and then I wrote an article about a lot of this that was widely published and um that further cemented my division with them. It's never been good since. <laughs> I just it's interesting that there's there there are always these seismic shifts in certain groups where the, the pendulum goes so far one way or the other and that there's really no, there, there was some sort of middle ground, obviously, while you were there and you were able to publish these studies and, and have this award go towards a biologist. Why, in your opinion, what is the reason that you think ethical hunting, Leopoldian hunting, these things took a back seat as a, and then it was just, it, it, it swung in the other direction that mostly predators are bad. They need to be eradicated or pushed off the landscape so that ungulates can sort of roam undeterred for human consumption or, or whatever it may be. Why do you think that shift happened or, or still continues to, to be there? And, and the ethical hunter or the Leopoldian hunter is looked upon as maybe less than, and I'm again, I'm not trying to project because I know there are hunters out there that believe in, in legitimate conversation, in conservation and protecting of these wild ecosystems and of these habitats and of these predators. Yeah. Oh, I think, you know, power, money, greed, selfishness, all of that ties into it. Um, the hunting world is, is powerful. I mean, you have all these industries that make hunting and fishing equipment, you know, Remington firearms and uh, Barnes bullets. And, you know, you could go on and on and on real tree camouflage. Um, and then you have the hunting media, then you have all these hunting shows and entertainment industry and, and so on and so on. And it's a very powerful uh, group of people. It's what Angela Heister, who wrote Beyond the North American Model, um, I think she called it the uh, industrialized hunting complex, you know, which is a good term because it makes you think of the whole industrialized military complex. Similar thing. And then you have the, you know, groups, powerful groups like the NRA and Safari Club and they get involved, and then the politicians get involved. And it's just this big, powerful thing. And um, it tends to be a very paranoid group 
driven by uh, lies and myths and misconceptions, you know, from from these groups. You know, think of the NRA and constantly trying to put fear mongering lies into people's heads about, oh, uh, Joe Biden's going to take all your guns. You know, Trump won't or or so on, which is funny because. Only four presidents in my lifetime have proposed any restrictions on rifles, and three of them were Republicans, including Ronald Reagan. So, I mean, it's just so ridiculous, you know, but people believe it. Democrats will take our guns. Republicans won't. And it's that simple. And they did the same thing in the hunting world that uh, because it's also tied to the gun rights. You have the NRA is very involved in the hunting world, too. They even produce a, a hunting magazine. When you join the NRA, you either get a, you can get their rifle magazine or their hunting magazine. And they're the ones leading the hunters. They're the ones telling hunters that any possible questioning of hunting is anti-hunters that'll end all hunting. You know, if you think baiting bears is unethical, like I do, and has negative impacts on bears, and you support something like, let's ban the baiting of bears, the NRA will jump on that so quick and say, here they are, they're anti-hunters. You let them take your bear hunting and they're going to take everything. They're going to destroy America, our Western way of life. They're socialists, they're communists. They're, I mean, this is it's that ridiculous, but for some reason it works and it, they're powerful. And um, And I would say the great majority of hunters fall into that. They're ultra conservative. They don't trust outsiders. They... Uh, they're easily persuaded by the NRA and Safari Club. They think wolves are not only eating all our elk, but that wolves were um, a different evil subspecies brought from Canada that that are larger, more vicious than the, elk, the wolves that lived here. They think that um, a lot of them think that wolves were planted here by anti-hunters who hope to end all hunting by getting rid of all the elk. I mean, it's just ridiculous, but, and I'm baffled by it. I don't get it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I think uh, they control everything. And it's a weird system. And because hunters think they pay for conservation, which they don't, we love to say that. We do pay for anywhere from, say, 55 to 65 percent of the state wildlife budgets. Here in Montana, hunter and angling license sales pay for close to 65 percent of the budget of Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And then they also get additional funds from Pittman Robertson funds, which is from the sales of, you know, rifles and, uh, and bows. And then there's also uh, another fund that's funded through the uh, Dingle Johnson Act, which is uh, money that comes from uh, the sale of boats and fishing equipment, that kind of stuff. So hunters, because of this, like to say, oh, we fund conservation. But there's a couple of problems with that argument. One is, even though, say, hunting and fishing dollars pay for about 65% of, say, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks budget, not all that money goes to conservation. A lot of it goes towards setting up shooting ranges and training more hunters. A lot of it goes towards killing wolves, which I don't consider conservation. A lot of it goes towards creating elk habitat, uh, maybe setting up water developments in dry country so elk and deer can live there where they never historically lived. In other words, or introducing non-native species like pheasants and uh, Merriam's turkeys, wild turkeys here in Montana that weren't native, you know, so people have something to shoot at. In other words, because hunters and anglers pay so much of that budget, the management is geared towards appeasing hunters and anglers and providing things to catch and shoot at. This last winter, I was ice fishing on Georgetown Lake in Montana, and I caught a, a brook trout, which is native to the east, not here. But in Georgetown Lake, they were stocked, and they're considered, uh, they manage it for a trophy species for anglers to catch. And the one I caught wasn't big enough legally. They have to be, I think, 22 inches to keep, and mine was about 18 inches. So I had to throw it back, which I don't really like. I'm not a big fan of catch-release fishing. I don't think it's a good ethical treatment of a, another living being to toy with it and play with it, you know? Right. So I, but I threw it back. But then I was thinking of the irony, how I had to throw this non-native species back because they're managing it for us, us fishermen so we can catch things. 
while at the same time they were up in the mountains slaughtering wolves, native predators, because that's what hunters want. And so this is what happens. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, these are the people in Montana that are electing our government. And then the, uh, the governor appoints a game commission that oversees the fish and game department. And that's usually, uh, you know, they usually place hunters and outfitters on that game commission. And um, so because of this, hunters have a lot of influence and control over wildlife management decisions. Um, and they like to say a lot of it's based on science, but it's not like wolves. So, of course, you know, um, they put pressure on the state to kill more wolves. And now, you know, you can shoot wolves from airplanes. You can poison them. You can kill pups in their dens. We're basically carrying on a war against wolves. And hunters like to claim that's conservation. So I guess what I'm getting at here is um, even if you're a good Leopoldian ethical hunter, when you buy a hunting license nowadays, and a lot of hunters like to say, oh, that's going towards conservation, maybe part of it. But it's also going towards slaughtering wolves uh, and suing the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to delist grizzlies. So then we can start killing grizzlies. And, uh, yeah, you know, so I, I almost don't want to buy a license. And then the other part of that is not everybody that buys a gun uh, or a rifle are hunters. In fact, I think I've seen statistics that show uh, only about 40 percent of those buying the rifles are hunters. So it's disingenuous to say that those are all hunters funding conservation. And then when you figure out the cost of federal lands, where most of us hunt here in, in the West, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, we have a lot of, you know, U.S. Forest Service and BLM lands that belong to all of us. And all Americans help pay into that through taxes. And when you figure out the cost of public lands, the contribution of hunters overall into conservation comes to about six percent and the rest comes from you know everybody That's else fair, right? and yet because of the way the system is set up hunters have amazing influence and control over the state wildlife agencies and that's got to change we need to reform wildlife management so that we all have a say and all species are protected including wolves and grizzlies and um, I'm kind of rambling again, but that's why lately I've been very involved on the advisory committee of a really good uh, group called Wildlife for All, which is trying to bring together all citizens that love wildlife, hunters, non-hunters, anti-hunters, you know, everything, uh, to set aside our differences and say, hey, we all want to protect our wolves and grizzlies and healthy functioning ecosystems and we need to reform state wildlife management if it's going to happen. And so that's, that's one of the things we're working on. I talked about that a little at the Yellowstone conference. Yeah. I, think. I, I, I mean, you, you've really run the gamut here and I, I, I love it. And, and I, I, I trust me, you're not rambling by any stretch. I love all the information that you're giving. Oh, you know, I, I, I always like to say, you know, cause we, we've had to say this where people are worried that they're, talking a lot and that's the that's the point of these is that we we get the information out there from individuals like you and you touched on that I, I do remember you talking about that at the at the wolf summit about wildlife for all about just look going briefly back to what you were you were talking about prior about the north america model of wildlife conservation how that isn't a great model to go av you know to go after uh and that these it's actually hurting the balance of the ecosystems and hurting the, you know, the, the predator prey relationships and hurting uh, all of these things that we take for granted. I mean, if you obviously for wildlife for all or, or moving forward, I mean, what do you think are ways, obviously you say we have to reform the, the, I guess the, what do you say? The fishing game or whatever it is, we have to reform those organizations. What's the best way to do that? What's, what are ways that people can, get involved if they are looking to help conserve these predators, wolves, bears, uh, to keep these wild lands wild? Because I think that's something that other people, I, maybe people aren't as aware of, is that there's privatization of wild land that's happening. That land is being bought up and then used for 
these types of things. I mean, what's... Well, for starters, and I'd like to go back to the North American model for a minute. Yeah, too, go ahead, please. Because that ties into your yeah. question big time. It's actually not a bad model. You know, the North American model of wildlife conservation was developed in uh, like the late 1990s. Now, you hear some hunting groups talk about it now, and you would think that Theodore Roosevelt himself found these tablets on the mount and brought the North American model down from the mountain. And, you know, I mean, seriously, it's like when hunting groups talk about this, it's like they, the sky opens up and there's angels and they talk about like the North American model. The Elk Foundation has even said it's the, uh, the greatest model in the history of the world. You know, there's just all these things. And really here's what happened. There was a guy named Dr. Valerius Geist, an interesting character, a, uh, Russian born German scientist who moved to Canada <laughs> and he was an expert on elk and mule deer in particular and ungulates. And he sat down with a couple other wildlife biologists one time in the late 1990s. I think his name was John Orston and, uh, and Shane Mahoney. And uh, John was with the U S fish and wildlife service. And I'm not sure if I got his last name, right. And uh, Shane was also with a wildlife biologist in Canada. And they basically outlined these seven uh, seven tenets that they felt made wildlife conservation in America, North America, successful, and that those tenets should further serve as guidelines in the future. And it became known as the North American Model of Wildlife Conservation. And the seven tenets, I'll go over them real quick, is that uh, wildlife is a public trust, that markets for game are eliminated, that allocation of wildlife is by law, that wildlife can be killed only for legitimate purpose, uh, wildlife is considered an international resource, uh, science is the proper tool to inform wildlife policy, and democracy of hunting is the standard. So what I like to tell people, a good beginning to reform wildlife management would be to actually follow the tenets of the North American model. It's not bad. And hunters love to tout it. And they're just like the Christians, uh, the right-wing evangelical Christians who will uh, quote Bible verses but ignore everything, <laughs> everything the Bible actually says, you know, the type I mean. And that's what they're doing because it's not followed. I mean, you can't say you support the North American model and, and then go slaughter wolves. But let's take a look at that. We're slaughtering our wolves. Um, because a handful of people want them slaughtered. Is that democracy and wildlife management? You know, is that honoring the public trust? Is that science driving management? No, it's lies, myths, and misconceptions. Uh, is killing wolves a legitimate, you know, purpose because they think they're saving elk? Uh, you know, it goes against almost every tenet of the North American model. Um, and now they want to do the same with grizzlies. And then you have people out there. Um, killing prairie dogs for fun and entertainment. And it's disgusting. They'll take out rifles that are similar to like the, the M40 sniper rifle I had in the Marine Corps, where I could consistently hit a grapefruit from a thousand meters, you know? And these people are out there with that kind, those kind of weapons shooting at prairie dogs. And then what they'll do is they'll uh, have electronics read the distance and they have contests to see who could shoot and kill prairie dogs from the greatest distance. Um, and then they'll pose with a sign. They'll pose in front of dead prairie dogs and there'll be a little sign might say uh, uh, 1,500 meters. You know, like, it's just bizarre. And then these people will turn around and tell the North American model of wildlife conservation. I mean, what is their legitimate purpose for killing these prairie dogs that are such a critical component of uh, prairie ecosystems? You know, and... Uh, it's ridiculous. And then they have predator killing contests where they all get together and see who can kill the most coyotes within a couple of days. Um, they have high tech deer. Um, a, a judge just ruled here in Montana that Montana couldn't allow people to use like some sort of thermal imaging infrared yeah, infrared, yeah. night cameras to find wolves. Like we needed a judge to tell us that. I know. It's like, I, I once wrote an article called, uh, Space Age Technology, Stone Age Pursuit. And in that article I talked about, in the opening, I talked about how one time I was sitting in northern Norway on the Russian border looking at Russians uh, during the height of the Cold War. And it was cold. It was like 
40 plus below zero up there. And, uh, and we had infrared scopes. I mean, this is back then too, you know, things have advanced a lot more, but you know, these high powered sniper rifles, infrared scopes, night vision, uh, the ability to, to do all these things. And I remember joking with one of my co-Marines. I said, what if we could use this technology hunting? And I was just kidding. Nowadays, you can walk into a hunting store like Cabela's or Shields. All of that and more is for sale to help people kill wildlife. It's literally a war on wildlife. I just don't understand why. Why would you go to that extreme? And, and again, I know it's not it's not everyone, but it's it it just doesn't square the the circle doesn't square for me to say what's the need because I there there was a post and I, I hear you about the prairie dog thing because I read that I read about that and I also saw there was a post with someone who was touting that they killed a wolf from I think it was over a thousand meters or something I mean that again we're not talking about ethical hunting we're not talking about fair chase and we're just talking about like you say more of this I I guess war but just the the, the fair chase thing to me doesn't it's not fair chase this animal is is no, is no, is, is, sit, is sitting around living its life doing whatever it's doing not knowing that there is a predator being a human that is in another zip code that could take it down and it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense i mean for you how does i mean we we've you we, you've covered it all it's just i don't know i just i hear these things and i still can't as many times as i hear it I still just can't wrap my head around the fact that there are individuals or groups that think this is okay and that this is something that is all right. It's just, it, it's normal everyday practice. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know how to answer that. And <laughs> yeah. I think it goes way beyond fair chase and ethical hunting too. Right. I mean, those are important. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a system that's out of control, a powerful system driven by a lot of uh, special interests and money and greed and power and, um, and certain groups that feed people with a lot of lies and misconceptions. And there are people, unfortunately, susceptible to that, who for them, uh, truth, facts, logic don't matter. They want to believe what they want to believe. And the NRA and Safari Club are going to tell them. And, um, you know, even the best of hunters, I I've, I've lost jobs over speaking out about this stuff. You know what I mean? You you get blackballed. It's like McCarthyism. Suddenly you are pegged as the anti-hunter. And uh, and even the best of groups, like backcountry hunters and anglers, for example, which isn't a bad group, but they don't speak out against any of this stuff. They're not trying to change the system. They're not trying to reform wildlife management. They tout the North American model like it's great and everything's fine. And they, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they spout the uh, myths and lies about how hunters fund conservation and we're the greatest. And, uh, and they're not going to speak out because they have to appeal to a mass group of hunters. Right. So instead they become a good old boy hunting group that gathers and drinks beer and works to protect public access, which is important, but I don't consider it conservation. Um, right. And they're not going to speak out in defense of wolves and grizzly bears because they'll lose their support. They'll lose their money. They'll lose their advertisers. Um, right, they'll lose the way to, to, to make it forward. Um, so it has to be changed to get back to your question, which was a great question. I always like to say that the first step in reform would be, uh, let's read the, the seven tenets of the North American model of wildlife conservation, and let's try to follow them. That would be a great start. <laughs> and, and then, uh, we need a system where more people pay into wildlife conservation. You know, some of the ideas I've seen thrown out there might be uh, uh, you could buy a wolf or grizzly bear stamp to help protect wolves and grizzlies. You know, that kind yeah. of stuff. Colorado um, did that recently with the reintroduction. They have the license plate program, which I think yeah. is great. It's wonderful because that all of that goes to help the coexistence non-lethal that are going to help those those farms, those ranches, those people that are living with the wolves in the western slope. I think that's that that that's a good positive way to to another way that they're helping. Yeah, and then we need to accept and let other people in on the decision making. Um you know, we need to 
we need to appoint non-hunters, maybe even anti-hunters, um, onto our game commissions. And we need to get, you know, politicians in office. I think we need to go even further, though, because I don't have a lot of hope that a lot of state wildlife management can be reformed. Because we're talking about some pretty red states like Montana and Idaho and Wyoming. But I think when it comes to our public lands, our federal lands, our federal wilderness areas. I mean, a few years ago, Idaho paid a trapper to go into the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness, which is Forest Service land, land that belongs to all Americans, land that was set aside in the Wilderness Act of 1967 to keep things wild and try to protect this healthy functioning ecosystem. And they sent a trapper in there to totally eliminate a pack of wolves because the hunters and the outfitters didn't like the wolves. Now, <laughs> why did this small group of hunters and outfitters have that much control over what was done right. in a federal wilderness? That should be illegal. That should not have been allowed. Right. Um, and if the feds have to step in to protect our wolves and grizzlies, fine. I personally think wolves need to be put back on the federal endangered species list because <laughs> states like Montana and Wyoming and Idaho aren't proving they can be trusted with the management, you know? Wow. So those are all important steps for reform. I think people just need to become uh, aware of the issues and come together to, to change things. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but at the end of my talk at the Yellowstone Wolf Summit, there was a woman who was clearly anti-hunting who got up and uh, I don't know if it's proper to say confronted me. She was very respectful and polite. But she said, how can you justify going out there and killing, you know, an animal like an elk? Do you, do you remember I think I that? Do, yeah. And um, my response was, you know, and I stick by this. I respect that a lot. Like I said, I love that Edward Abbey quote, hunting such a difficult thing to think about. Never mind talk about such a storm of conflicting emotions. And I get where she's coming from, and we probably would never fully agree on the hunting part. But I guarantee you, I would agree with her on more things than I would agree with most of my fellow right. hunters. So why can't we sit down, set aside our differences, look at all the things we have in common, and fight to protect wolves? Because clearly that woman was passionate about protecting our wolves and I'm with her a hundred percent on that. You know? yeah. I think, I, and, I, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I know, and I, I'm cognizant of your time. I mean, Oh yeah. Yeah. No I mean, it's the, the wolf summit for, for you, cause you presented, but you were also were there for, I believe the, the whole time. What were your thoughts and, and feelings coming out of that summit and, and how that was put together? And, and like you say, there were, differing opinions there, which I think was good. And it, it, it opened the door, I think, for a lot of, like you were saying, this merging of thought processes and people that maybe come at things a little bit differently to for a common goal, which, like you say, is to protect wolves, specifically in talking about that summit, but also going further and talking about public lands, bears, lions, anything that may possibly be affected. So where did how did you feel coming down from that? <laughs> well, that summit really motivated and inspired me in a lot of ways. Um, not the least of which um, I've kind of gone through some personal struggles of recent years and haven't really been that active in the wildlife conservation realm. And I was really surprised when I was asked to speak at that conference. I almost turned it down. And then it's funny because I haven't done that in so many years and I was really, really nervous about it. And uh I was practicing and practicing and going through my little note cards. And you met my son. Yeah, Corey, I did. Yeah. 23, goes to college here. He's a wise guy and I love it. I'm very proud of him. And uh, it was really funny because he was getting sick of me practicing my presentation in front of him. But he finally said something to me that really helped me. He said, Dad, just throw those note cards in the garbage and get up there and talk. <laughs> and I actually, I took my son's advice and it went well because I've gotten great response, including you guys, which is yeah. awesome. And, um, uh, and others, and, uh, I'm getting more involved and I'm writing. So in a way it kind of, uh, got me back into the realm. It motivated and inspired me. It motivated and inspired me to see so many people who I may not agree with on a lot of things, um, 
share a love of wolves and wilds, you know, come together to talk. Um, wolves of the Rockies uh, is run by Mark Cook, who's the founder, and that Kim Bean. And uh, both of them are remarkable people. I've gotten to know them both. And um, they excel at bringing diverse interests together. You know, and I mean, just to hear the park superintendent speak and then, uh, you, you know, Doug Smith, who uh, retired as being their chief wolf biologist, who I'd never met before, but was so familiar with him. And then to be able to sit and talk with him. And he's such a, uh, I think what impressed me the most is, is here's a guy who, is, without a doubt, is one of the leading wolf experts in the world. <laughs> And he was just so kind and pleasant and humble, you know, and, and he sat and talked with my son for a long time. My son is a, a environmental studies major, and my son was so excited to meet him and talk to him. And so everything about that conference to me was motivating and inspiring and really kind of got me off my lazy butt to start doing more. Ever since that conference, I've been trying to, to focus and be more productive and, uh, writing more op-eds and getting involved with various groups and uh, staying involved with Wolves of the Rockies. And uh, in fact, next weekend, I'm going on a, a camp out sponsored by uh, Save the Yellowstone Grizzlies, a group that Doug Peacock started, who I talked nice, about earlier. Yeah. And um, we're going to camp out for three days and have meetings and speakers and talk about how can we all get more actively involved? Because I don't know if you're aware of this, the states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming have sued the federal government to get grizzlies taken off the endangered species I list have, yes. so that states can manage them, which will mean when states say manage, they mean kill. So that means people will be killing grizzlies faced on false pretenses that somehow it'll uh, reduce conflicts between bears and humans. At a time, grizzlies are really facing a lot of challenges because their habitat is changing from climate change they're losing their white bark pines and other traditional food right. sources so they're wandering more out into uh, places looking for alternative food sources and at the same time more and more people are moving here in the west and, and so there's increasing conflict between humans and grizzlies and the grizzlies are being killed and then uh, most grizzly biologists agree that we currently have grizzly populations in these small isolated populations. You have the Yellowstone and then the Northern Continental Divide and then a small population in the Yak. And there needs to be uh, some connectivity. We need to allow those populations to spread and merge and create, you know, a bigger population. I mean, grizzlies right now only inhabit less than 2% of their historical range. But you have the hunting community saying, there's too many grizzlies. They're dangerous. They eat elk. They're going to kill us while we're hunting. Um, we need to start killing grizzlies. That'll make them fear us. And that'll save America and the world and our Western way of life. <laughs> and only the socialists will stop us. I, I, I'm a little sarcastic when I say that kind of thing, but that's really kind of how it is, you know? Oh, I mean, it's just... It, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's disgusting. So anyways, I'm, uh, I'm now much more engaged in these issues like I used to be and uh, getting excited about it and hoping we can all make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're a huge driving force and it was, it was great to, I mean, Mark, it was so funny because Mark came up to Steven and I and he goes, you get, have you guys met Dave Stalling yet? And we go, no, we haven't. And he goes, I'm going <laughs> to, he's like, you, you got to talk to, you know, Mark, it's, I, and Mark, I hope he listens to this, but he, he's, when he gets excited about something, I know it's, not that he, not, it's like you need to follow the excitement because he just gets very, you, know, you have to meet this person. You have to do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and, oh, yeah. And he won't let and he you won't rest. Let you rest. And I, but I love that about him because he, he's so engaged. He's, he's really he's, an incredible. He's guy. an incredible individual. Um, my, I just have two more quick things for you, Dave, because I, I, again, I'm trying to be, sure. um, the, the first is if anyone is listening to this or when people listen to this, what's your, the thought or the that you want to put out for everyone who's listening that is for the fu like for the future of conservation for the future of the wild lands the wildlife what what's the prevailing thought that you want to come out of this discussion that people can sort of hang your hat on from you because like you said you you now have 
you 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 have the bug to continue to do this to to write more to be involved what's the thing you want people to take away from from our discussion from you <laughs> save the grizz no <laughs> <laughs> that's a good start i never i'm never that concise um i really just wish that more people would uh would get informed to learn about these issues learn about the complexities of them um learn all they can and get involved and be willing to set aside our differences to achieve common goals. I mean, I know an awful lot of people who love grizzlies and wolves and want to help protect them and uh, probably don't like us folks who kill and eat elk, but, you know, we can set that aside. <laughs> Maybe not talk about our diets right now and focus on protecting uh, what's important, right. our wildlife and wild places. And um, and I guess along with that, I think humans as a whole, our society in particular, needs to learn to let go of control. We don't have to control nature. We don't have to control the wilds. It's not all here for us. You know, there's intrinsic value in these wild places and wilds. Um, Grizz. And wolves have as much a right to be living on this planet as us, if not more so. (laughs) And um, we've got enough of the world. We've taken over everything. We control everything. Let's give them the space and respect they need and uh, work together to protect that. I love that. That's my message, I guess. I'll have to work on that and refine it a bit. But to sum it up, save the grizz. (laughs) I love it. No, it's it's really great. It's it's a good solid message. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, good. My my uh my last thing, my very last thing for you, Dave, is when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes to your mind? Oh boy, wildness and freedom. Mm. That's two words, mm. but uh, they're to- closely connected. Yeah, I mean, Dave, this has been really really terrific. I, again, I I can't appreciate you enough for sharing your stories, your, your knowledge, your insight. And to have you on Wildlife for All and, and being part of these these causes and, like you say, to be advocating more so again, uh, it's only going to help uh, all the all the critters out there, all the wildlands out there, and all the people that are looking to keep uh, the West really wild in a way that it's it's meant to be. So again, thank you for talking with me for for uh, just giving your all for this and uh, for everything that you do. So really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And same back to you. I really appreciate it. It's a wonderful discussion. And um, I appreciate the work you're doing to help increase awareness and understanding. Thank you. Of course. How's to you all out there? And we'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking for more information about Wolf Connection or the podcast? Please visit our website at wolfconnection.org where you can donate, sponsor a wolf, or become a volunteer.